All right. Oftentimes, and usually it's, it's Sunday right after the service because I go out into the lobby and I wait and I, I uh, you know, kiss hands and shake babies and all of that. And um, you guys give me a lot of feedback on my messages. And, and I love that. Um, I love that I know that it's, um, it's hitting you in certain areas. It, it feeds my ego. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, you know, you, you know, a lot of you just say, oh, that was a great message. That was a great message. And that's cool. I, I like that you like it. And, and then sometimes you are like, you know, oh, man, this really, this was, you know, you must have been following me this week. And I'm like, yeah, I was. No, I, I don't follow you, I promise. But it's, you know, it's, it's, I said something or we talked about something that really, you know, spoke into a specific area of your life. But there's, there's one time in particular that I remember very vividly and specifically. It was about a year ago, um, and I don't know if they were just visiting or, or I don't remember who it was, but they came up to me and they, they paid me one of the highest compliments on my sermons that I've ever had. <clears throat> and they said, you know one thing that I really like about your preaching? And I'm like, oh boy, here we go. What's that? And they said, you do not shy away from talking about sin. I'm like, thank you? You know, I'm like, <clears throat> I think that's a compliment, right? And they're like, no, no, no. Like, you are not afraid to talk about it. And, and, and I was kind of dumbfounded for a minute because I was like, well, yeah. I mean, it's in the Bible. Why would we not talk about it? And then, of course, you know, it started, I started realizing, like, pastors and preachers are often afraid to talk about sin because, well, sin is convicting. Uh, sin is difficult to talk about. Um, sin can upset people in your church. And when you upset people in your church, sometimes they leave. And sometimes if people in your church leave, they don't give offering anymore. And if you don't get offering, you can't, you know, keep the lights on. And so a lot of preachers kind of have this thought. And, and for a minute there, I was like, well, yeah, we talk about sin here. And I mean, what kind of a crazy pastor does a whole series called Tough Topics right? And all we do is we talk about difficult things that are going around in this world. But see, that's what I want to do. I want to never shy away from God's Word and what it says here. So just please continue to pray that I would speak with boldness God's Word uh, to you guys and as well to my heart. So with all of that being said, we are going to talk about everyone's favorite subject today, sin. Yes, and sin, is it that big of a deal, right? That's the question. Now, hopefully you understand that's, a, that's kind of a you know, satire a little bit, sarcastic question. Is it that big of a deal? It really is that big of a deal, and we're going to um, look at it today. But I wanted to say that right then because people sometimes take things on YouTube and they clip them and it makes it look like, I don't think sin's a big deal. It's a really big deal. Now, the original word for sin it's not this big theological term, and most of you guys know this. The, sin actu or the, the word sin actually comes from an archery term. So way back in Bible times, they would, they would have archers, and the archers would draw back and they would shoot at a target. And if they missed that target or missed the mark, it was a sin. They were a sinner if they missed the mark. Well, that's pretty much the same as it applies to the biblical sin that we know that, hey, listen, God set a standard, God set a target, and we shoot at that target, and sometimes we miss that target. What is that called? It's sin. And see, you know, God's like, listen, I've, I've made this target. I've made this set of rules, this standard, this way I want you to live. And when you do life and you shoot at that target, but you miss, and you choose a different standard, God's like, listen, if you follow what I'm trying to put out there for you, this target here, your life is going to be so much better. And we're like, no, 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 no. See, God, I have life figured out. Now, that's a dumb thing to say to God, okay? And maybe we don't say it like that audibly, but that's how we act, isn't it? That we 
treat God sometimes in some areas like we've got life figured out, and God, you can have these little areas of my life right here, but this area over here, I'd rather you stay out of. And God's like, ah, see, it kind of doesn't really work like that. And we rebel. We reject those standards that God has put there. And, and honestly, the standard that God has put for us is perfection. Well, that's kind of sobering, isn't it? And, and we can look at it and, and we could say, well, that's not fair. And you guys know, I actually, somebody said it to me this morning. That word fair, that's an F word in my house, okay? We, we, we don't, you don't want fair, Okay, fair ended in the Garden of Eden, which we're going to talk about today, but that's when fair ended. If we got fair, if we got what we deserve, believe me, that's not what any of us want. But we say, God, that's not fair. You, you expect us to be perfect. Why did God do that? Why does God set a standard that's unachievable? this perfect, this righteous, as the Bible calls it. Why is that? Well, see, here's, here's what we have to realize. God created perfect in the Garden of Eden. Everything was perfect. How he set up life was perfect. Adam and Eve didn't have to work for anything. I mean, they didn't really have to do much, and it was perfect perfect. But who messed it up? Man, we did. And so we say, God, that's not fair that you require perfect. Uh, we messed it up. And there's also this thing, and I want to touch on it real quick, called inherited sin. And here's another one of those things where you might say, well, that's not fair. See, we all have this inherited sin because Adam and Eve sinned. They passed that down to their kids and to their kids all the way back to our great-grandparents, grandparents, our parents, and they passed it to us, and we will pass it to our children. That's inherited sin. It's just sin that you're, you're born with, and, and that's it. So reaching that standard of perfection... <clears throat> Guess what? It's not really going to happen. And so I get it. I get it. We could look at that and go, okay, God, you require perfection. I have inherited sin. I can't control that. That's not fair. And you, you, you might have almost a little bit of a point, except here's the problem. <clears throat> By raise of hands, who has ever willfully, knowingly, you knew what you were doing and you did it anyway, sinned. Okay, you can put your hands down. Hopefully that's all of us. Some people raised both hands and like a leg, okay? <clears throat> now, we take that whole argument where it's God, that inherited sin thing isn't fair, and we can throw that right out of the window because we have all chosen to sin. Every single one of us, and it was probably more than once, right? Just maybe, a, maybe just two or three times that you have chosen to sin in your life. So here's, as it pertains to our message today, I want to give us a definition of sin. It's missing the mark. It's not hitting God's standard. But for how we're talking about it today, here's my definition of sin. Sin is making choices that oppose God's word, will, and perfect plan. It's, it's when we choose to go against God's word, his will, and his perfect plan, resulting in a separation from a close relationship with him. Okay, what's the result of that? It, it, it separates us from our relationship with him. Now, ultimately, sin, I guess I'll use this word again, ultimately separates us from God. It separates us from eternity with him. Not just the relationship and the communion that we have here on this earth, and yes, very much sin separates us from that relationship and that communion, but sin ultimately, eternally separates us from God. So we've got a problem, don't we? We've got a really, really big problem that we need to deal with, and we'll talk about it today. Now, we live in a society 
where sin is very much downplayed, don't we? I mean, we can, we can turn on the TV, we can look around, we can look at our friends, we can look at ourselves even and see how sin is just constantly being downplayed as much as possible. Why? Well, here's a few reasons. Because sin is fun, right? Did you know that? Do, I don't, probably don't have to tell you that, do I? And I say this all the time. You're like, no, you're not allowed to say sin is fun. No, no, no. Listen, if you don't think sin is fun, you're not doing it right. Now, I'm not going to give you lessons, okay, although I could, but it's fun for a while, and then it catches up to you. But we, we downplay it because it's fun. We downplay sin because sin is popular. I mean, sin is, is celebrated, isn't it? I won't go all into it, but sin is very much celebrated in our society. Um, here's another reason why we downplay it is because our flesh, uh, Scripture calls it the old man inside of us, the, our old selves, our flesh desires sin. We desire to sin against God and to choose to live our own way. And so we, we, we downplay it so often. I'll prove this a little bit more. We even are now changing what we call sin. What, what we used to say, oh, this is a sin, and we call out the name of that sin— we're, we're not doing that a whole lot anymore. Now, now, I have some examples here. This is taken a book that was somewhat written in satire, but it's somewhat true. Um, we don't say dishonest anymore. You can't say that. That's wrong. We say ethically disoriented, okay? Or a lie. We, we dare not say that somebody lied. That was just a counterfactual proposition. Um, the word promiscuous. You know, um, Scripture talks a lot about it, right? The sexually immoral. And, and then, you know, promiscuous is, a, is a more of a word that we would use now. We definitely don't say that. We just say sexually active. Or um, how about a drug addict? We can't call them a drug addict. That's offensive, so we say they have a pharmacological difference. It sounds like they went to school for that and got a degree, right? How about a drunk we don't call them a drunk. They are chemically inconvenienced or sobriety deprived. That's probably a little more accurate, right? Here's one, and we just, you just have to turn on the TV and you see this a lot, stealing and looting. You know what we call stealing and looting now? Non-traditional shopping. <laughs> a serial killer, we can't call them serial killers anymore. They're just socially misaligned. And last but not least, we don't call it murder. It's a health altercation. Wow. That reminds me of this true story that there were three pastors, and they went to this pastor's convention, and they were in this uh, kind of breakout small group area, and, and one of the pastors says, you know what, I, I, I think it's just really important for us to share with each other our secret sins and just confess them to each other. So the pastor says, you know what, um, I'll go first. My secret sin is I love to gamble. I, I, I am a gambler. When I go out of town, it's ka-ching, ka-ching, let those slots ring, right? That's me. And so the second pastor, he's like, all right. I, I, he's like, you know what? My secret sin is that I hate working. I hate what I do. I hate being a pastor. I hate preparing messages. I just copy everything off of the internet. I don't meet with people. I don't do any of that. And the third pastor's like, hmm, well, my secret sin is gossiping, and I can't wait to leave this room. <laughs> Genesis chapter 3. If you would turn in your Bibles there, it should be pretty easy to find. We all know this story pretty well, and um, even if you don't attend church, even if you've never cracked a Bible in your life, you know this story. We see examples uh, all around in culture of this story. So Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 1. We are going to end up reading through this whole chapter here. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. Now, 
pause there. There's a lot of things that we just read through in the story and don't look at for a minute. And like, I, just my inquisitive mind goes, okay, the serpent was more crafty. What does that mean? Like, was this a real snake? Was it different? I don't know. You know, so I start thinking about these things. But all throughout Scripture, we can look, and, and one example is Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. It says, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. So we know, okay, bodily form, it was a serpent, it was a snake, but really, obviously, it was the devil there to tempt Eve. So it goes on, it says, he, the serpent, said to the woman, now pause right there. We, we, gotta, we gotta talk about this for a minute. What in the world is a snake doing talking to someone? And notice she doesn't freak out. She doesn't go, oh my goodness, a snake is talking to me. She just talks right back to it. Does that mean that before the fall, animals could speak? I don't know. I was asking you. I was hoping that you know. Okay. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, Notice that there was no like prior discussion about what God already said. Somehow he knew what God said, and, and maybe there was some pre-discussion there, I don't know, but he just kind of leads right off with questioning what God had said. He leads off with this challenge of what God said and a challenge of God's love. Because here's, in essence, what the devil is saying. He's like, listen, if God really loved you, he'd let you eat from every tree here. He's holding back from you. He must not love you or really want the best for you because God's holding back. What kind of a God would hold back from his creation who he says he loves? That's what the serpent is saying here. Verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. Now, <clears throat> so far, so good. Like, things are still kind of going okay. She counteracts the serpent with truth. He comes with a falsehood or questioning God's goodness. She comes back and just gives him truth. Now, at that point, where it, where it goes south from here, is she should have said, hey, you know what? I'm not talking to you anymore. I see what you're doing here, and she could have told him to leave, or she could have just walked away. You know that whole get thee behind me Satan thing? That should have happened right here in this moment, but it didn't. It reminds me of another true story. There was this couple, and um, the husband was just cheap. I mean, just as cheap as could be. And they got up one Saturday morning, and the wife said, hey, honey, I'm going to go shopping today. And the husband just, he about blew his lid right there. And he's like, shopping? No, 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 you can't go shopping. She's like, don't worry, honey, I'm just going to go window shopping. I'm not going to buy anything. He's like, okay, you better not buy anything. So the day goes by, she comes home, she walks in the door, and sure enough, she's got a bag in her hand. And it's a beautiful new dress. And her husband sees it, and he is like, he, he just, he loses it. He's like, what, what are you doing? I, I told you, don't, don't spend any money. Don't, don't, don't go shopping, just window shopping. She's like, well, well, I was, so, so I went to the mall, and I was just looking in the window, and when I looked in, I saw this dress, and it was beautiful. I mean, it was, it was hanging there, so I thought, you know what, I've got, I'm just going to go in and look at it. I'm just going to go look at the dress. So she walks up to the dress, and she looks at it, and she's like, wow, it's really, it's, it's even more beautiful up close. And she's like, you know what, I, I'm just going to try it on. I'm just going to try on the dress. So she goes in the dressing room, and she, she tries it on, and she goes out to the mirrors, and she's looking around, and, and she's like, so I, I, she tells her husband, I, I was just so tempted. It was like the devil was there tempting me to buy this dress. And he says, well, why didn't you tell him to get behind you, Satan? And she's like, I did. And he said, girl, from back here, it looks good too. <laughs> Verse four. 
I like the second wave of laughter there. Verse 4. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Again, here's what he's saying. He's like, listen, God doesn't like competition. God, God doesn't want you like him. He's holding back from you. When you eat this fruit, your eyes are going to be open. You're going to be so smart. You're going to be just like God. And God doesn't like competition. And it's kind of funny because, well, if, if you look at other parts of Scripture, Satan had a bit of a confrontation, or back then he was Lucifer, had a confrontation with God where he wanted to be equal with God. And God said, no, 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 we're not going to go there. And God kicked him out of heaven. So he's kind of speaking from experience in here. Is like, he's like, listen, God doesn't want competition. He's selfish. He's holding back good from you. <clears throat> Verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. Here's our first point. Simple followers of Jesus know that attraction does not equal permission. When you are attracted to something, when something just looks so good and you think, man, it's going to make me happy, that does not equal permission to take it. Her desire to fulfill her flesh, that desire that she had, overcame her desire to fulfill God's future for her. Isn't that what happens? Isn't that how it works with us that we just, we, we, it, this thing's going to make me happy. Like, like, and, and God just wants me to be happy, doesn't he? Yes, but you know what God wants more than your happiness? Your obedience. Because God knows that when we obey, we will be the happiest. When we follow his way, his word, his rules, his target, his mark, when we follow that, we aim for that, and we hit it, that's what God knows. Hey, we are going to be the happiest. And when we sin, we, we make our own path, we choose our own things, and it doesn't end up making us any more happy. I think the, the theologian Cheryl Crow was a little bit off, and she said, if it makes you happy, then what? Then it can't be that bad. Mm, yeah, it can. Verse 6 again. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. Now, here's another verse that I want us to look at as well. Look at the similarity of this verse. Here's the Apostle John writing in 1 John 2, 16. He says, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, good for food, the lust of the eyes pleasing to the eye, and the pride of life desirable for gaining wisdom. All of those things, they come not from the Father, but from the world. See, see what's happening here is all three of those things, all three of those desires inside of her took over because she allowed herself to be tempted. So verse 6 again, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And when sin becomes attractive, we must flee as our flesh will make us fail. The, the, the flesh that we have, just our desires without, without God's help, and, and trust me, we need God's help every single moment of this life. And when we deviate, when we say, God, I don't need you today, I'll check you out, revisit you on Sunday or whenever, and when we just kind of put God on the shelf, that's when we fall prey to the desires of our flesh. Proverbs 23, 31 and 32 say, do not gaze at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. That's that just desiring that thing. Just, just swirl. I'm just, I'm just looking at it. I'm just window shopping. He says, in the end, it bites like a snake, 
and poisons like a viper. Never let your craving overcome your conviction. Simple followers of Jesus know that attraction does not equal permission. It goes on, it says, she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. We're going to come back to this here in a few minutes. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Now, do you think God didn't know the answer to those questions? I'm pretty sure he did. He knew where he was. He knew that he ate from the tree. But I think he wanted Adam to realize and to admit his sin. Verse 12, the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and ate it. Um, What's that called? Blame. Okay, parents, if you ever wonder where your kids get it, like from the earliest age, like they get in trouble and they point a finger at someone else, if you ever wonder where that comes from, it's right here. I'm just really glad as adults we don't do that, right? Maybe just a little. Verse 13, then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. What do we call that? Blame. There it is again. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This is such a cool verse. I believe this is the very first messianic prop, uh, prophecy in all of scripture. This is speaking about Jesus. He's saying he is going to come back and he will crush your head. You'll bruise his heel. There's going to be some trouble and some strife and some problems, but ultimately he's going to crush your head. Verse 16, to the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Ladies, say thanks a lot, Eve. Verse 17, to Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Here's our second point. Simple followers of Jesus understand that the consequence of sin is worse than you think. We cannot downplay the severity and the consequence of sin. And we make, a, again, in this society, we make such light of sin, and we celebrate it. And we just can't do that. See, they didn't have to grow, work, or worry about food It was just there. I mean, you want to talk about low-hanging fruit. There was just fruit on the trees. I mean, they barely had to reach and grab it. They didn't have to plant for it. They they didn't have to do anything. It was just there. They didn't have to worry about their surroundings. They were carefree, and I'm going to leave it PG here, but they were just carefree, okay? Um, Their environment was perfect. The temperature was perfect. No problems there. Uh, Their perfect health was guaranteed. Imagine that. Imagine living a life where you didn't have to worry about your health whatsoever. You could eat whatever you wanted, however much you wanted at any given time. Didn't have to worry about going to the doctor. 
None of that. And, and probably the biggest thing is they had daily face-to-face communion with their creator. Like they got to walk with God in this garden. And they traded all of it for a bite of a piece of fruit. Sad, isn't it? (laughs) See, eating fruit, no big deal. I mean, come on. It was just a piece of fruit, right? Or violating the one rule that God gave them, that would be a big deal. See, how we look at sin is very, very important. We can try to play it off as, oh, they just took a bite. No, 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 no. They just violated. I mean, God gave them one rule, one rule, and they broke it. We've got to stop belittling sin. The consequence of sin is worse than you think. Now, I want you to put yourself in their shoes for a minute. Think about it. Think of how they felt in that moment when they finally had to admit that they broke God's one rule. Like, can you imagine the shame and the remorse and the guilt that they felt? Uh, it, It must have been unbearable to understand and realize what they were losing, that separation from God, the damage to their relationship with him, this this perfect, wonderful place. Can you imagine the despair? But two verses later, there's hope. And, And the writer of this, it's like he inserts this one verse, verse 20 in here, just to give us some information, and then he goes back to the story. So verse 20 says, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. And then verse 21 One of the best verses here. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. You're like, wait, why is that such a big deal? Here's why this is a big deal. It's because I don't don't know. I obviously wasn't there. Okay, I don't know exactly how this went down. But I think here is a picture of, of what actually happened. And it, it, it may have gone down differently or something, but I picture God coming and taking a lamb and slaughtering that lamb right there in front of them. Now, that was probably the first instance of death that they had seen. And he skinned that lamb. And, and I, I just picture, again, I don't know exactly how this went down, but I picture him taking that skin still dripping in blood and wrapping it around their naked bodies. Why in the world? That's so weird, Trevor. Why do you picture it like that? Because think about it. When they sinned, what was, what was God's promise about their sin? You will surely die. Sin always results in death. And in that moment, now eventually, they died an earthly death that God hadn't planned before for them. But in that moment, there had to be death. And so I believe that was the very first sacrifice to show them something gets to take your place. Something shed its own blood and was wrapped around you as a covering, as a protection from your sin. Again, I, I don't know exactly how that went down. I, I, I don't know exactly what it looked like. But here's what I do know. Simple followers of Jesus understand that a covering is better than a cover-up. God's covering. God, God coming to us and wrapping himself around us in our shame, in our guilt, in our despair... God wrapping himself, the sacrificial lamb, around us is way better than hiding our sin, than sowing fig leaves. I don't imagine fig leaves were very comfortable to wear. 
But God took this skin and wrapped it around them as a sacrifice, as a payment, as, a, as an example of the sacrificial lamb that was going to come in Jesus. God, I think in his complete mercy, his grace, his justice, he punished them. And, and, and don't you know that punishment, punishment from God is grace and mercy because God does that just the same as we do with our kids. Hey, don't do this anymore. This will not help you. This is ultimately hurting you. But his grace, mercy, and justice, he punished them, and then he gave them that, sacrifice, that sacrificial covering. I wrote this down. Seeking God's total forgiveness or covering is the only way to rectify our choice of sinning against him. We don't get to earn our way out of it. We don't get to anything but just seek God's forgiveness. And that forgiveness is the covering that we need because we are dead in our sins, dead in our trespasses, as Scripture calls it. Verse 22, And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Now, we read this quickly and pass over it pretty quickly. When you hear the word cherubim, oftentimes we think of those, you know, fat little angel things that fly around and shoot, you know, arrows and all that. No, no, no. These were massive beings that every circumstance in Scripture where it says an angel appeared to them, you know what they did? They fell on their face afraid. Okay, so picture that being or beings with a large sword that was flaming, and they were doing this. Go ahead. Try to enter into, we'll see what happens, right? Yeah, we're probably not going back into the Garden of Eden, right? Now, why? Think about it. God was saying, listen, if you get back into the garden, and remember, there was two trees. There was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's the tree that they ate from, the forbidden fruit. And there was also the tree of life. And God said, no, 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 you can't come back in here because if you eat from the tree of life, you will live immortally, eternally on this earth in your broken, fallen, deteriorating body. Let me just tell you, that's not good. This kind of brings a little bit, and I don't want to too much go here, but this brings a little bit of a different light on death, doesn't it? Remember um, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade? I think that was the one where they went to go find the, the chalice that supposedly Jesus drank from, and you could, you, know, you could be immortal if you drink from this same cup. And they, they finally get into the chamber where all these different cups are, and Indiana Jones has to choose the right cup, and the one guy chooses the wrong one, and he like melts. It's really cool, right? And, but there's that, that, that soldier in there, and he was, I don't know, he was medieval or something. He had been in there for hundreds and hundreds of years, it looked like because he had drank from the cup, and he was there to protect the cup, but he was so old and so decrepit, he tried to get up, and he tried to wield the sword, and he just kind of fell over. Imagine living like that forever. Anyone, anybody want to live forever like that? No, you don't. So this was God's protection, saying, hey, listen, I am protecting you from doing this, from getting back in the garden. Now, where did the garden go from here? I don't know. Maybe they never returned. Maybe God wiped it out in the flood. That's kind of my theory. I don't know if it's that important to you when you get to heaven. You can ask God, okay? Now, here's the good news. God has something way better than the tree of life, way better that will give you immortality or eternal life. 
than eating from a tree. And that's his son, Jesus. And we often go through life thinking that Jesus isn't enough, right? Because oftentimes we're taught, and depending on what church you go to or whatever, it's like, yes, I believe in Jesus, like I, he, he is my Savior, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to heaven, I'll spend eternity with him, but I also have to be a good person, or, yeah, Jesus, but also my church attendance. Or Jesus and um, my giving. Or Jesus and, just let me tell you, there's no and. It's kind of crazy to think that we think we can add to God's grace and mercy. Like that, that we think we need to do things to help out Jesus. That him hanging on a cross, dying a miserable death, shedding out all of his blood as the sacrificial lamb, like that's not enough, that we've got to do something to add to it. Let me just tell you, none of that is in Scripture. It is just Jesus, as we sang just a few minutes ago. That's it. There is nothing that we need to do to add to that. It is only by his son, by God's son, Jesus, who hung on that cross, that we can have that eternal life. So I want to challenge you this morning. I want, I want, to, I want to challenge your faith a little bit. Number one, do you see sin how it ought to be seen? Are there things in your life that you're just kind of sweeping under the rug that you know it's wrong, you know you shouldn't be doing it, but you just, you're sweeping it under the rug. Hey, I'm grateful that God just doesn't zap us every time that we do something wrong. He gives us time to straighten it out. So that's the first question. Is there sin in your life that you're just making light of? And the second question is that we just covered are you trusting in Jesus and Jesus alone, or is it Jesus and? Because believe me, you can't good enough your way into heaven. The measuring rod is not the person sitting next to you. The measuring rod is Jesus. And all have sinned. And even if it were just one choice sin separates us from eternity with God. So here's our three points. Number one, simple followers of Jesus know that attraction does not equal permission. Number two, simple followers of Jesus understand that the consequence of sin is worse than you think. And number three, simple followers of Jesus understand that a covering is better than a cover-up. Let's pray. God, thank you that you sent Jesus. Thank you that in our sin, in our shame, in our regret, in our despair, you have made a way. That God, we can simply call on your name. Just say, Jesus, I need you. I've been relying on my good works. I've been relying on church attendance. I haven't been relying on anything. I just didn't know what I believe. But Jesus, I need you. If that's you this morning, if you know today you need to get your relationship with Jesus right, I want to give you that opportunity right here in this moment where you are. Just say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I want you. Jesus, come into my life. Be my savior. I trust in you and you alone for my salvation. Thank you that you've made a way for me to spend eternity with you. God, save me. God, change me. 
I give you my life. If that's you this morning, if you said that for the first time, I would love to know about it. I'm not going to call out or make any commotion. Heads are still bowed, but I just want to know. I'd love to be able to pray for you. Would you just slip your hand up and say, I got it today. I understand today that it is just Jesus. And I trust Jesus as my Savior. Thank you. Anyone else? Today is the day that I am giving my life to Jesus. Thank you. Maybe you're here this morning and you're just struggling with sin. Hey, join the club. We all are. But would today be the day, whatever that sin is that God has brought to our mind, would today be the day that we say no more? That we say, God, I'm going to give this thing to you. I'm going to make it right. God, help me to overcome my flesh, this desire in me. If that's you, would you just put your hand up so I can be praying for you? Thank you. Anyone else say, hey, I I need prayer. Thank you. Thank you. Hands all around the room. Church, may today be the day that we decide we are going to give up the desires of our flesh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And that we will just speak the name of Jesus. God, fill in the gaps where we are so weak. Through our weakness, you are strong. God, we pray for this time of offering. God, thank you that we have an opportunity to give. Thank you that we have an opportunity to make a difference in this world. God, help us to be a generous church, to be generous to this community and in the world and do things that will matter in 10,000 years. And Jesus, we love you, we praise you, and it is in the most awesome saving name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.